everybody. My name is Boo Frabel and I'm here tonight as a producer for the Pan World Voices Festival. Um, on behalf of nearly 5,000 writers, translators, and editors of Pen, it is our great pleasure to welcome you to the 13th annual Pen World Voices Festival of International Literature. Uh, Pen America is an organization that stands at the intersection of literature and human rights to protect open expression at home and abroad. We champion the freedom to write, recognizing the power of the word to transform the world. Our mission is to unite writers and their allies to celebrate creative expression and defend the liberties that make it possible, now more than ever. This is no ordinary time for Pan America. We face unprecedented threats to our most important shared values, and your support is so important in fighting to protect freedom of expression and the press, defending fact-based discourse, and resisting measures that would impair the free flow of ideas. For more information about Penn and details and other festival events, bless you, visit penn.org or our info table out in the lobby to learn about becoming a member today. Uh, I'd like to thank the sponsors, supporters, and volunteers who make the Penn World Voices Festival possible. And thank you all for coming tonight, and thank you to our guests for agreeing to take part in tonight's panel. Tonight's panel is uh, uh, moderated by Mira Jacob who is the author of the critically acclaimed novel, Mira Jacob. The author of the critically acclaimed novel, The Sleepwalker's Guide to Dancing, which was a Barnes & Noble Discover New Writers pick. It was shortlisted for India's Tata First Literature Award, longlisted for the Brooklyn Literary Eagles Prize, and translated into 11 languages. Uh, Mira is currently drawing a graphic memoir titled Good Talk, which we're all eagerly awaiting. Please welcome Mira Jacobs. I, just, I decided to um, switch it up a little bit instead of going back and forth to the podium because I want a little more time with our authors. We have a real treat tonight. Um, we're going to be talking about illicit love, which is, as you probably guess, a fantastic subject. And we have these four really beautiful books to talk about. So I'm going to tell you a tiny bit about them, and they'll introduce each author, and they'll read a bit, um, and then we'll talk afterwards. So Doreen Rabinian's novel, All the Rivers, tells of the passionate but untenable love between an Israeli woman and a Palestinian man. Sarah Ladipo Manika's beautifully titled Like a Mule Bringing Ice Cream to the Sun explores the erotic yearnings of Mariah De Silva, a Nigerian septuagenarian. In Shani Wutu's Moving Forward Sideways Like a Crab, we meet Jonathan, a Toronto man who has tracked down the mother who abandoned him in Toronto only to find her living as a man named Sydney in Trinidad. And Paitim Stasovi's My Cat Yugoslavia tells the story of a young man who walks into a gay bar and meets a fantastically seductive cat. <laughs> so all of these books um, touch upon, very beautifully touch upon, um, sort of the fragility and the, the way that we try to move toward each other and connection and sometimes meet it and sometimes fail. And I'll let the author's work speak for itself. But I'm going to start with um, Dorit. Dorit Rabinian's third novel, All the, Riv All the Rivers, recently published by Penguin Random House, has become the center of a political scandal in Israel, as the Ministry of Education has banned the book from the high school curriculum. Rabinian's previous novels, Persian Brides and, a, and a, stand, sorry, a Strand of a Thousand Pearls, were both international bestsellers and have been translated into 15 languages. We're delighted. Dorit, would you like to read? Being here tonight, am I heard? Uh, my language is Hebrew. I promise you that I write better in Hebrew than I read in English. You'll have to excuse me. I'll need help. I'll assist with you. Uh, okay, so the story of uh, Liat, the Israeli, and Khilmi, the Palestinian, who meet not far away from here in downtown Manhattan, West Side. Uh, starts at one evening, uh, Hilmi's keys are lost and Liat joins him to the journey, the quest after those lost keys. 
We turned back to Broadway and headed south this time from 28th towards 10th Street. We walked briskly, purposefully, alert to every metallic glim glimmer on the sidewalk. Down to Union Square, right, then left, and down 6th Avenue, Hilmi taking large, energetic strides, paving a path for us through the crowds and me behind him, as we search among all the moving feet in case the keys had fallen on the way, we passed the same window displays and brightly lit alleys we've seen before, the same doorways of shops and giant department stores, the same lines of trees and shady treetops and office buildings now on our left, dark and, lo and locked. The repeated sights brought a reply to our chatter. Everything we had said an hour earlier going up Broadway, but the conversation also proceeded in reverse order, from end to beginning. Like playing a record backwards and imagining subliminal messages emerging from the garbled sounds, or rewinding a cassette tape with its squirky, distorted backplay. So my sense of guilt, so my sense of guilt accelerated and grew sharper, and my heart pounded faster, matching the beat of our hurried steps. In retrospect, I noticed all the things I have missed before when we had walked, when, when I had talked longingly about the sea in Tel Aviv and raved about my diving adventures in Sinai. I recalled how he had kept quiet here and hadn't responded there. And I remembered a serious look he had given me at this intersection and how, right here, when we stopped to gaze at the moon, he had sighed deeply. I was now attuned to every tone of voice and every expression I thought twice before speaking, phrased things carefully to prevent any misinterpretations that might arise from my English. I nodded vigorously whenever he spoke, and laughed too loudly at his jokes. I scanned every inch of the sidewalk, throwing myself into the search for the keys in an attempt to compensate, to repair, to, repair, to restore what had been lost. A spontaneity, a light-heartedness that was no longer there. Kosher, kosher, kosher. All the delis in downtown Manhattan seemed to, be, to have become kosher, and I spotted more and more menorahs lit up among the Christmas trees in the shop windows. Two ultra-orthodox men with climbers and bobbing sidelocks came towards us, and further down the street we could hear the thunderous dabuka drumming from a tattoo and piercing den. Another branch of hummus plays another corner store selling newspapers and magazines in foreign languages, including Maariv and Idiot America, alongside papers with Arabic headlines. We entered a desolated darkness of a pub and asked to use the bathroom. While I stood outside the single stall in the women's restroom, waiting for someone to emerge, I wondered whether Khilmi in the men's room on the other side of the wall was also reading the word in the little door lock, occupied, and was he thinking also about the occupation? Thank you. Our next reader, um, born in Ireland and raised in Trinidad, Shani Mutu is the award-winning author of Valmiki's Daughter. He drowned, sorry, he drowned she in the sea, long listed for the IMPAC Dublin Literary Award. 
and Sarah Spoons at Night. Her latest novel, Moving Forward Sideways Like a Crab, was longlisted for the Scotia Bank Giller Prize and shortlisted for the Lambda Literary Award. Mutu divides her time between Grenada and Canada. Hello. So I'm very, very pleased um, to be reading at this particular festival, um, and with uh, with everyone on the stage here, it's quite an honor. I'm I'm going to read from uh, uh, Moving Forward Sideways Like a Crab, which uh, is is set in uh, partly in Toronto and partly in Trinidad. Uh, the section I'm going to, and it's told from many points of view, and all first person, and sometimes they blur into one another. Um, so I'm going to read you one section that's uh, spoken by Sidani. Actually, it's spoken by Sid when she was Sidani. Okay? About ten days after the incident with Eric, Zane and I spent our last day together. It was a Tuesday, the day on which every week, Angus, her husband, ate dinner and played poker after work with friends at a club in Port of Spain. Zane and I ate dinner, went to the guest room and propped ourselves on the bed next to each other. We pushed in the door, but not fully closed it. Zane wanted to explain why she'd been open to an affair with Eric. She reasoned that Angus was her first and only love, that they'd been together now for so long that they were like siblings. She wanted some mystery in her life, some excitement, to be seen again as a sexual being. We lay back in the bed like old times, her head on my shoulder, my arm effectively around her. She nodded off and I dozed and woke and dozed and woke knowing this was the last time I would see her on that trip. As I held her, it came to me that I'd never regarded Angus as a threat to my relationship with Zane. He was instead my aid, and I was relieved that Eric, the real threat, was no longer in the picture. I could hold Zane and, regardless of the truth, imagine that I was the only one giving her the attention she craved. I could pretend that out of this could grow more. I convinced myself there was no harm in my imagining or pretending. Then I heard a noise outside the door. I lifted my head. Someone was there. I pulled my arm out from under Zane's neck. She awoke and we both sat up quickly. We heard footsteps running up the stairs. Then the door at the back of the house shut. I whispered that we should call the police, call Angus. But Zane insisted we should first go and look outside. By the time we reached the gate, we could hear a car driving away, although we couldn't see it in the dark. Zane was silent. She didn't appear to be frightened. She was rather seething, but offered me no explanation for her reaction. I asked her if Eric had a key to the house. And with some relief at being able to admit it, she said, yes, he did. Now it was my turn to be enraged. I asked if she'd gone mad, and she nodded. Although Angus travelled for work, she explained, she'd always refused his desire to hire security guards for the house while he was away. She felt that an alarm system was enough protection, even though she seldom bothered to engage it. Eric worried about her for the same reasons as Angus and felt that Angus was slack not in not hiring a security company, regardless of what she wanted. A couple months ago, he'd gone with her to a nearby hardware store, taken her house key from her and copied it, so that if there was any trouble at her house while Angus was away, or even if she was frightened for any reason, he would be able to come over at once. It was a matter of trust between them that he would never enter the house without her prior knowledge and permission, and of course would only do so when she was there alone. Angus had always given in to her, and Eric's protectiveness and insistence 
made her feel simultaneously vulnerable and taken care of. She found she liked the idea that someone would step in and then do what needed to be done, not only without her having to ask, but against her wishes. So she let Eric make the copy. I said nothing, but I was appalled. For a moment I felt I didn't know who Zane really was. She hadn't yet had a chance, she concluded, to get the key back from Eric after their fight on his boat. She would deal with it that the very next morning. When Angus returned, he sensed our unease and insisted on knowing what was bothering us. I said I was upset because I didn't want to return to Canada. I no longer wanted to live in a place where I didn't have family and where I wasn't part of a community. Zane busied herself fixing him a plate of food. She and I were quiet, but Angus didn't seem to notice any more. After he ate, we readied ourselves for the long drive south back to my parents' home. Just before we left, Zane called me into her bedroom. She held my hands in hers and said in a low voice that what Eric had done that night was wrong, but that I wasn't to worry. I made her promise that she would arrange to meet him only one more time for the sole purpose of getting back her key, and that she would do so only in a public place, in daytime. Then she went to her dresser, opened a drawer, and pulled out a bulging white envelope which she handed me. She told me that for years she'd been saving whatever US currency she came across, and that after her many conversations, she knew what she wanted to do with that money. In the envelope were two rubber band bound bundles, each one holding 30 $100 bills, $6,000 in all. She would not accept my protests, insisting that I was to use it to do whatever would make me more comfortable in myself and in the world. Angus and Zane drove me back to my parents' house, and that was the last time I saw Zane. I returned to Toronto and over the course of the next few days, she and I spoke on the phone a couple of times. In one of those calls, she told me that the day after I left, she'd gone to the trailer on the yacht club grounds and confronted Eric about the key and the intrusion. He had laughed with incredulity and ridicule as if she were mad. One week after I left Trinidad, one week and one day after she and I had lain on the bed in her guest room, I was awakened by a phone call early in the morning. When you live in another country, far from your aging parents, every call from them causes a lurch of fear. A call outside the usual schedule can stop one's heart. My parents knew this, so they would begin each call by saying, Hello, Sid, everything's okay, how are you? Um, but this time my mother's first words were, Sid, it's mom. I waited some seconds for the usual reassurance. None came and so I braced myself for news about my father, or my sister Gita, Gita's son Devin, or her husband Jane. I hope I didn't wake you, my mother said. What happened? I responded. What are you doing? answered my mother. And this made me sit up in fear. I repeated my question sharply and she answered, we have some bad news. Something has happened. Is dad all right? I asked, getting up out of bed. Yes, it's not our family. We're all right. So what could be that bad, I wondered. Her tone was not one that suggested her reason for calling was mere gossip. What are you doing right now, she asked again. For Christ's sake, Mom, just tell me what happened. Well, I'm worried that you're alone. Are you alone? What happened? It's Zane. Zane was suddenly a name that seemed strange, unfamiliar. For a few seconds, I didn't know who my mother was talking about. As realization dawned, my legs buckled and I sat back down. There was a home invasion at her place yesterday. She was alone at the time. What happened, I asked, but before she could answer, I spoke again. What do you mean by a home invasion? The house had been broken into, she said, ransacked. I knew that robberies were never what they appeared in Trinidad. The room was spinning and I started to shake. I couldn't summon the words to ask if Zane was all right. A small voice, someone within me asked, what did they want? Mom didn't answer and I knew then that Zane was dead. Oh God, don't tell me, please don't tell me, I cried. I heard my mother say, I'm so sorry, Sidney, I'm so sorry. I wish you weren't alone. 
Between sobs, I had sense enough to ask for details. Was it a really a robbery, Mum? It's very strange, Sid. The house was trashed, thrashed. But apparently, but according to the reports in the news, the police are saying that nothing was taken. We were both quiet for a moment. I'm sure that what was in my own mind was also in my mother's. The only thing that really mattered had, in fact, been taken. When did this happen, Mum? I finally asked. Last night. What day is today? It's Wednesday, she said. Tuesday night. That's when Angus plays cards in Port of Spain with his friends. My mother said simply, yes. Somehow we managed to end the call. My mother had promised to call again as soon as she had all the details for the funeral. But when she reached me a day later, she had other matters on her mind. Sidani, so I hope you won't mind, but I have something to ask you. Just a minute, I want to shut the door. There was a pause while she stepped away, then returned. You there? I want to ask you something, but I don't want you to get annoyed, you hear? I'm not asking this to quarrel with you. I think I know the answer, but I want to hear it from you. My heart pounded. I thought I knew what was coming. I'd already decided that Zane's murder was the work of Eric, or someone hired by Eric. Perhaps Eric had been caught and had, had, had said something to the police, to the papers, to the world about Zane and me lying in the bed in her guest room. Had the police arrested anyone? I quickly asked my mother. She said no and then bluntly, I want to ask about the two of you, said Annie. I was relieved and panicked at once. She waited and I remained quiet. She tried again. Well. Look, you're really mashed up about this thing. You're all alone up there. I don't know what to do. Was she and you... You know what I mean. Did you like her? Well, not like. Come on, you know what I mean. My mother, I saw for the first time, was willing to talk to me. In an obtuse manner, perhaps, but as best as she could, about this aspect of my life. But I dared not answer. Look, Sidani, I'm not asking to get annoyed, she reiterated. I'm just worried about you. Like air released from a full taut balloon, fear rushed out of me, and I felt oddly appreciative of this new interest and concern. I stumbled over my words, telling her that Zane knew about me. I trembled as I admitted that I'd always had strong feelings for Zane. But she and I were never anything more than friends. And I hastened to add that in any case, Zane hadn't been that way herself. I told my mother that Angus knew about me too. But even so, he hadn't in the least minded Zane and me being friends. Even if Zane hadn't been married, I said, she wouldn't have been interested in me in that way. Normally, I would not have liked to admit any of this. I would have preferred that anyone who wondered would never know the truth for sure, but on this occasion, still unable to fully process the fact of Zane's death, I felt an overwhelming relief at being able to voice all of this to my mother. I went on to explain that it was because of my intense friendship with Zane that I'd come to realize I wanted, as my partner in life, someone who didn't need an interpretation of my home ways my home vocabulary, who would know what I meant if I said, I feel like a good line tonight, or who understood without explanation what made a comforting homemade meal for a Saturday night, what rituals were fine for a Sunday lunch, for a picnic, for Christmas lunch. My mother remained silent throughout this rush of words, and I was emboldened to say that I wanted to be with someone who, no matter how this body of mine aged, would love me and continue to want to take care of me. I talked nonsense. I wanted to be with someone who would notice that when the hem of my pants had come undone and without asking or telling me would have it mended. Someone who would see that I'd run out of toothpaste and would, without asking or make a fuss about it, pick some up on her way home. I told my mother that it was Zane, the woman, the Trinidadian, the wife, the mother, the friend who had made me see the incongruity between what I was and what I wanted. And it was Zane who had made me realize that I would probably be alone for the rest of my life. I stopped then, unable to go on, openly weeping. After a long silence, my mother replied simply that she would book the ticket for me to return for Zane's funeral. Thank you.
Oh. Um, our next reader is Peter Mr. Sorry, is Peter Mr. Skolovsky, um, whose debut novel, My Cat Yugoslavia, relates the inner conflict and questions about one's identity um, that immigration, homosexuality, and the past might stir. He's currently studying comparative literature at the University of Helsinki and screenwriting at Alta University School of the Arts, Design, and Architecture. Welcome. Thank you, and thank you all for, for coming. And uh, I have to agree with Dorit and say that, that I write better in Finnish than I read <laughs> in English. And uh, it's somewhat uncomfortable for me to, to be reading in a foreign language, but... but uh, <coughs> Let's see how it goes. Bear with me. Yeah. So I'm reading two excerpts of my, my book, and the first one is uh, from the scene where the protagonist uh, first meets uh, the talking cat in a, in a gay bar. Ugh, the cat said as though he were about to vomit. What? Gays. I don't much like gays. I was astounded. People don't normally come to a place like this if they don't like gays. When I asked the cat why he didn't like gays, he explained he had nothing against homosexuality, per se, just gays. Before I could ask him another question and point out that people usually liked gays but not homosexuality, <laughs> the cat clarified his answer. Obviously, I like all kinds of tongues, but I hate bitches. He said abruptly and crossed his paws on the table. You have to decide whether you're a man or a woman, he continued and leaped suddenly onto the table, raised his backside in the air and stretched his front paws. Just look at that, he said quickly, fixed his eyes on the men on the dance floor and wagged his tail. How repulsive. Men's hands don't move through the air like that, and men don't talk the way women talk, and men don't wear such tight tops or wiggle their bottoms like, like that, like a prostitute, a whore. The cat snapped so loudly that the dancers turned to look at us. The cat wound his way between the pins of cider and jumped back onto the sofa. Christ alive, and sex between men is even more disgusting, unnatural through and through, horrid, absolutely horrid. He declared. Wouldn't it be easier just to leave people in peace, I asked, and let them be themselves. Hippie, said the cat pointedly. <laughs> it so happens the world works rather differently. People have expectations and opinions. There is no getting away from it. Yes, I think you're right, I said. That would hardly be a surprise, he said, wallowing in self-satisfaction. He smartly stretched out his paws and gave a brazen smile. The cat assured me that his opinion of gays wasn't based on mere hearsay, but on bitter personal experience, for he had once met two gay guys. He had, had been backcombing his luxuriant fur in the bathroom of a local restaurant when two gay men had cornered him. According to the cat, the men marched up to him, stood on either side of him and began pointing at his handsome flanks and shiny tail as they might a piece of meat. And the cat had felt so objectified that he'd been forced to stop his preening and cover up his sweet curvature. <laughs> so yeah, and then my second excerpt is from a, from a, from a, this, uh, the protagonist is talking about uh, in this chapter how people react when they get to know that he owns also a, a, a pet snake, a boa constrictor. When people ask my name, I sometimes give them an honest answer, but just as often I say it's Michael or John, Albert or Henry, because that way I avoid the next question, which is, where are you from? I always wonder why people want to know that. Are they asking me because they are genuinely interested in my home country or in order to make judgments about me? Because it's one thing to tell someone you're Swedish, German or English, and quite another thing to say you are Turkish or Iranian. 
it's only very rarely that someone's home country is of no significance at all. When I invite people to my apartment, they generally accept because they are fascinated by the fact that I own a snake. They take off their shoes, step inside, and see the terrarium with no snake inside it. Oh. When I tell them it's probably under the sofa, they stop at the living room door and ask why I decided to have an animal like this as a pet. Before answering, I always have to correct them. This isn't any old snake. This is a boa constrictor. On a few occasions, I've told them the truth and said, I don't know, because I'm actually afraid of snakes. Still, most of the time, I simply say that I got it because I know a lot about snakes, because they are calm creatures, suitably independent, and don't need much looking after. A snake is the perfect pet for someone living alone. When I start pulling it out from under the sofa, my guests suddenly need to go to the toilet. And when they come back, they have to leave. They back off and start putting on their coats. It's too big and terrifying as I wrap the length of its body around my shoulders and its skin isn't slimy as they thought, but dry like soft plastic, like shining silicone. A giant thing like that, wow, they gasp as they open the door. Aren't you afraid? What if it gets into the toilet and slithers down the drain? They close the door after them and I wonder why they ask things like that about the snakes. About the snake. It could just as well learn to moisten its skin in the toilet bowl and sl slither out again, or learn to do its business there just like everybody else. Is it really the case, I wonder, as I stroke its coarse head, that people expect the worst of it simply because it is a snake? who's raised in Nigeria and has lived in Kenya, France, and England. She teaches literature at San Francisco State <coughs> University and serves on the board of Hedgebrook and the Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco. Her second novel, Like a Mule Bringing Ice Cream to the Sun, was shortlisted for the 2016 Goldsmiths Prize. Okay, so now it's really nerve-wracking following people who's First language is not English, and yet they can read it so well. So I'll just pretend that my first language is not English. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to read two short excerpts from this book, like a mule bringing ice cream to the sun. And uh, I, there are some sensual bits, erotic bits, which I'm not going to read because I'm going to choose to focus on forbidden love around the notion of the other. I've just lost my place, which is a wonderful way to begin. Um, okay. Bear with me one minute. <laughs> okay. okay, so my book has a main character, and she's named Mariah De Silva, and it's about her, because about her life and her friends, and she has an unusual set of friends. And one of her friends is a Palestinian shopkeeper called Dawood. And so I'm going to introduce you to him first. And this takes place when my main character is walking down the street and she sees Dawood. And this is how he greets her. Assalamu alaikum, beautiful flower for a beautiful woman. You know, I say that because I forget her name, which is not good, because she never forgets mine. And to tell you the truth, once upon a time, she must have been stunning, such a tall woman with a fine ass, even now, she was probably even stylish, you know? But now, at her age, with all those bright colors and the pencil and the things sticking out of her hair, it only make her look odd. And if she do buy something which isn't often, because she is one of those that prefers the organic street, the organic shop down the street, then she only buy my cheapest flowers or a small packet of apricots. 
And this never makes sense to me, because if she buy all that expensive stuff down the road, then why she don't buy my expensive flowers? Amira, that's my sister. She said the woman is just eccentric. But that's my sister being kind. Amira, you know, she never say a bad word about anybody, which is why I have to take care of the family's business. And this is a headache. Wallahi, you know, with the shop so close to the hate Ashbury, with all the hippies and the pot-smoking lazies. And why all these homeless people? You know, I swear to God, it's because the family, they don't take care, you know, of the young ones or even the old one. You know, she see, she's all alone. Hey, can I help you? That's $1.75. Thank you. Here's your change. Oh, you know, she surprised me. She put all that change in my box for Palestinian orphans. I wasn't expecting that. But more likely, the only reason she don't steal is because she see me paying attention. And she was probably thinking that $3.21 make a good investment, if it means that next time I don't pay attention. But I'm not that stupid. You don't take a man uprooted from Yaffa and forced to walk across the desert with his family and accept me to know nothing, huh? No. You cannot fool a man like me. I know what people are like. Which is why my sister, she ought to listen when I tell her that a chain of falafel stores is what we should be doing. I know these things. I sense them. We could make it here in San Francisco, just like the French restaurants in the Russian Hill, or the Mexican restaurant in the Mission, or the Italian ones all over the place. Why not Palestinian? We could call it Yafer or Falafel Meister, or whatever sounded good to Amira, huh? It would be cheap, good, healthy, even organic, low fat. What you want? Vegan? Raw? Paleo? We can do it, you know? Cheap, easy, fresh. Whatever people want. And once we make it in San Francisco, then to Oakland, and then to LA, and then even to New York, to everywhere. But instead, what Amira she want? Cake! And who the hell is gonna buy cake in this neighborhood? You know, expensive cake, forget it. Cheap cake, maybe, but expensive cake, no way. Why? Because women in this country, there's always dieting. And man, like real man, everywhere they don't eat cake. Falafel, yes, but not cake. Okay, maybe birthday cake for kids, but then think about it. One kid would want a train cake, another kid would want a clown cake, and then another's gonna start crying for a cake in the shape of a ballerina. And who's gonna make those kind of cake? Not Amira. She wants the fancy one, with the honey and the pistachio like back home. But the problem is, America don't eat those cakes. Nuts! You know, I keep reminding her, it makes no difference. This is the home of peanut butter or Jimmy Carter or anything like that. America has a problem with nuts. And God forbid that someday some kid decide to have an allergic reaction to one of the Amira's cakes. Then what? Then the business will be finished. That's what. So that's, that's Dawood. <laughs> when it comes to birthdays. The first is to buy shoes. And this year's shoes have a sensible wedge heel with a peekaboo toe. On the outside, they're a deep, plush, scarlet red. And because it's a big birthday, I matched the shoes with my black chiffon dress and double string of pearls. Pearls that have accompanied me from all manner of places. From lunch with Mrs. Gandhi, to tea at Buckingham Palace, to this little place here in San Francisco where I really must get round to replacing the broken glass in my full length mirror. I climb onto the ledge of the bath and I hold firmly to the edge of the door 
to balance, just like I'm doing here, but not very well. This way, I can see both the shoes and the dress in the bathroom mirror, and imagine right there where I place the palm of my hand, the spot for a tattoo. For this is my second tradition, to do something new and daring with each passing year. Last year it was scuba diving, and the year before, learning to swim. This year it's the tattoo, and it's not just the fact of getting a tattoo, but it's where I intend to have it done that thrills me. I've decided that something on the wrist or the ankle would be too ordinary. My bakery friend has a Chinese dragon that spreads across her back with its feet perched on her thigh. She showed it to me unprompted one day and explained how it represented her family's heritage. She said she had it done in three sittings to manage the pain. I wonder how long it will take me to do my flowers. Not long, I hope, because I really don't like needles. Perhaps I should just have a small sprig of bougainvillea. You know, something like the size of one of Daoud's gifts, those flowers he's always giving me, inked at the base of my neck. I'd never have the courage for something as big as a dragon. But perhaps I could have a tiny little blossom, symbolic of the tropical climes that I so love. Yes. I'm beginning to think that this is a good idea. What could be more perfect to mark my 75th than this? And so I twist for a better view. And then, in mid-twist, I slip. listening to all of you, I was reminded of the real joy of, of going fully immersive into someone else's story so that the room fades and I'm just in it, so thank you for that. So we're talking about love tonight, and I was thinking, um, and I was thinking through your books, I feel like whenever we're talking about the coming together of separate entities, whether that's a romantic couple or a parent and a child or a man and a cat, you're also writing about the frictions that live between them and the parts that cannot um, connect, even in union. So I wanted to know what were the frictions that brought you to your characters? Do we? Yeah. What is friction? Oh, what is friction? The, the uh, somebody, the, the abrasive, the parts that, that don't quite um, connect, the part, the energy between them that repels. Do we go in the same order? You can, or? No, you okay. can just talk. Okay, so uh, uh, maybe in, uh, maybe the reason I wanted to read the first excerpt is because because my protagonist in the story is he belongs to an ethnic and a sexual minority, and then he meets this this random fantastical creature uh, in this bar and. Uh, and uh, because he feels so lonely and so like misplaced in the world, because he he comes from another country and he lives, he's an immigrant in Finland, so uh, so he gets fascinated by this creature who basically loads loads everything he represents, and he does that, to my opinion, because he feels like because he's in such a desperate need of like acceptance and and love and that's why he's ready to transform himself and to to change his opinions to agree with the cat with something like what the cat is saying because the cat is really oppressive and really really not not very stable mentally <laughs> but, uh, but but he thinks that he will be okay in the world if he can get someone like this to give him love and accept him, acceptance because that kind of love has in a way, crossed some border or some wall. So, 
that's why he's ready to do anything and to put himself out there and they end up moving in together and and uh, the cat like starts controlling his life and his apartment and he find, finds himself sleeping in the hallway and <laughs> so like a cat so yeah maybe for me it was like a, a need for for acceptance and love Um, friction on many different levels, I think. Um, but I think what, and I'm not quite sure this is exactly what you're asking, but I'll just go ahead anyway. Um, I think one of the main areas that I was interested in exploring in this book was friction around the issue of old age and or the way that people perceive, at least in a society like this society, um, the emphasis is on, on staying young and um, old people become more and more invisible. So here you have a flamboyant uh, character who has absolutely no intention of becoming invisible. Um, so watching her move through the world and deal with you know, those people who might just sort of look at her and dismiss her, but also just claiming her, claiming her space and claiming her flamboyancy, her sensuality and so forth. Uh, I guess um, the frictions, I will remember you for my whole life <laughs> that you taught me this word. Uh, it's, it's the one that is brought from within, the conflict from within with your imprinted, with what is right and what is wrong and where the boundary uh, is stretched within you. And this, those traditions and, and, and desires they're pounding and they're in a way competing one another. Between those two, you can see there's a lot of harmony going on. They create a symbiotic uh, universe, universe of them two in New York and they experience the could-be taste of a, may, of a maybe a peace treaty between themselves. And they debate and they go through a lot of uh, uh, very easy, smooth, and uneasy, and difficulties, but a lot of delights. But the conflict that they carry within them, the ambivalency they carry within their, their gaze, it's where the uh, discomfort comes from. It's where the question marks arouse and disturb them to be able to maintain this sweetness in what New York allows with its all opportunities, with all liberties uh, as a ground to play with, but still they have an identity carried within them and this identity cannot be eliminated just by the choices that can be made following your desires. So it's, it's the contradiction between the community that follows these two wherever they go. They have two communities reflected in every mirror that they're passing through, and every uh, shop window is is giving an echo to to what there is being carried with them, not only themselves as individuals. Yeah, and actually, I think in that scene that you read, if you if you go just a bit further in that scene, there's a really beautiful moment where. She's falling in love, but there's suddenly a need for her to see herself in a mirror, which I thought was really lovely. It's just this idea of when you are drawn to somebody, you suddenly need to affirm what is yours. It's also really interesting and dynamic and you do that well. Yeah, it's a point where they see themselves yeah. and the fact that she knows that there's this issue between them. She imagines that they're go going to go separate ways after this very strange evening that they spent together and she imagines that this mirror in 40th Street uh, would capture their vision together and it become a picture that is alive even when they pass through and keep on with their lives it's going to be kept this imagery of, of, of them yeah. I think it's a fantastic question because um, the, uh, the idea of friction doesn't actually just come up in one book, one story for me. It is in, it is in 
in trying to express something in the first place out of me onto the page. Um, uh, I don't really imagine a particular audience, but what I'm very aware of is that um, in all the, for every reader of anything that I write or anyone writes, there is a different book because a reader brings her or his own understanding or their, his or her own baggage to the reading, the interpretation of the work. Therefore, who am I speaking to ever? You know, and are they going to understand what I'm saying? So quite often I find that um, even in a person who is trying to say something, oh, well, for me anyway, I'm trying, you can hear it right now, I'm trying to say something and I, there are so many ways to express it, I'm not sure which one is the right way and as soon as I find one way, I can contradict it immediately. So I find that I often have, my stories are often told by several people and all of them trying to understand someone else's position from their own baggage, you know. So this is what, and, and also one of the things that I really enjoyed in this novel, um, Jonathan, um, whom Mira um, mentioned earlier, is the, um, the sort of um, son of Sidani, when Sidani was in a relationship with India, who is a white English woman, who gave birth to Jonathan. Sidani left the relationship when Jonathan was 10 years old. When he goes and finds Sidani living as Sid, Sydney in Trinidad, he's 40 years old. And I really loved the challenge myself of trying to get Jonathan, me, writing as a white man, which, you know, like, how? <laughs> but imagining, this is what the power of writing is, it's not to get it right, but to try to imagine, I think. Yeah. And, 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 and to also give a vision. So, here is Jonathan, this white man. But I've got to get Jonathan to understand why. He's very upset with Sidani. I've got to get him to understand and not just rail against. Because to be able to write and tell the story of why Sidney changed he cannot, it cannot just be about him. He has to understand Sydney. So Sydney tells him stories to try to help. So, some, you know, that's it, kind of. <laughs> you know, you actually brought up something uh, really interesting in this idea of trying to communicate something. Because one of the, one of the things I um, I've always try to tell my students in fiction is the job of the writer is not to solve the problem. You don't need to solve the relationship, right? You need to bring it up precisely and to explain something about it, but you don't need to, the work of the reader is to bring what they have to it. To that extent, and you were just talking about this a little in your own work, was there something, because as you know, books have their own life when they go into the world, right? And everybody reads your book and they have their own relationship. Was there something that you, uh, was there a reaction that readers had that was surprising to you um, in interacting with your own work, where you didn't intend for a reaction to come up, but there was something that kind of kept coming up in the reading of your work? Anyone have that? Yeah, sure. I think we, have, every one of us, had that in a, in a way. But uh, I mean, what happened to 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 me and the reception uh, to this book when it was published originally in 2014 in Finland? And I come from a, I moved to Finland from Kosovo when I was two years old, and uh, and uh, and oftentimes I would come across. Uh, critics and news articles about me that that were saying that that you should read this book because because you can see how we how we things are and how how our country is like from an immigrant's point of view, which was yeah. that made, that made me upset first, and then I started laughing to this because because I mean in worlds of fiction we create we don't have the power or the ability to to give give a give a voice to to anyone who has actually lived they are characters who are like came out from our imagination and and then uh, then and writers talk about this a lot nowadays 
about how their work and how their, especially if you come come from outside the Western world and write about the place you come from, you're expected to like to shed light to the culture or the place where you're you came from. And if you suddenly stop writing about your heritage, then then questions might come up. And, and it's may, may I suggest that it's uh, it's a it's a good point made that the fact that you had grown up being an a son of immigrators had made the molded shape design the voice that you give to your characters and it's a it's a good thing it's a it's, it's something that you should be happy about I think it's but it's a complicated right it's a complicated thing because I think that's there's the good part of it but there's also the part of it that I, I, I if yeah, I'm hearing you correctly I mean, yeah yeah I mean it's because right? because uh, because if you make like conclusions uh, from a from a story that is not real, and from the few people in it, that the world, that that to make statements like this, I, I feel like there is like some ethical questions involved. Maybe like how how do you do you base a statement like that on a work of fiction? Then it's because you're writing about about a few people and and. And your 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 characters of fiction can only represent themselves and not their cultural heritage that that they are a part of. So you're saddled with the responsibility of whatever yeah. of your body. I hope I'm making yes. sense of the writer's yeah. body. Yes, absolutely. I can say that the fact that my parents immigrated from Iran and I was raised in Israel had given me not only the perspective towards Israel and towards the language that I'm. Uh, elaborating my Hebrew, I mastered my Hebrew due to the fact that they were weak, that their Hebrew was uh, was uh, poor at that time. So my immigration daily from my Iranian house to the Israeli community, to the Israeli surrounding, and it, it was a twice a day immigration. They immigrated once, but I I immigrated twice a day from school home, from home to school. I think it had given me the perspective that makes me the narrator I am. And I, I, uh, I gave a voice to my Persian-Iranian mothers in the Hebrew, like I give a voice to the neighbor, the Palestinian neighbor, with my Hebrew. I redeem his weakness with my uh, powers in, he in Hebrew. In my my Israeliness is, is not only... Uh, my gain of identity, it's also my power to redeem others, to liberate um, the past, to, li to liberate maybe the future. Uh, it's, it's, I, I, see, I see it as a very formative element of who I am, and writing novels is all about asking in various ways who I am. This is my project, this is, the, I believe, the, the flag, the banner that is above every library in all languages, in all worlds, uh, the question of uh, self-investigation, of self-interrogating, trying to map identities and piece that together again. Yeah. Well, I think these issues of identity and who I am are interesting for all of us. I mean, I could just sit and listen to the stories that you're beginning to tell now. Um, one of the I, somewhat surprising responses for me with this book has been to have people say, uh, you know, I really enjoyed the bits in your book that are about Nigeria. And then there's a pause. <laughs> this book is set in San Francisco. And I think there's the expectation that we're, we're getting an African book, right? Um, I get that with the Trinidad parts of my novel. Yeah. Exactly. So, I, I, and yeah, I, I think you know. Ho hopefully, this is beginning to change. That people will not necessarily look at. We'll, we'll start realizing that you can tell more than the place that you're supposed to have come from. Um, but one of the so that's just a small thing for me. I also get questions about the book title, which is long and unusual. And oh, days, like people asking, but there are no mules in the book. What's this mule and ice cream and sunshine and um, so I wonder if you all, because you all have such interesting titles as well, had some interesting responses to your book titles. 
yours is the most unique. <laughs> <laughs> but now I, it, it, it arouses a whole picture, a whole life frame of, uh, yeah, with the sun, with the ice cream, with the mule. I, I, now, I now figure out that it's more an African association that you, you get your um, questions being asked about. You asked for it. <laughs> you titled your novel this way. It's a beautiful one. I want to hear about your you know, responses to all the rivers. Um, do you want to do you want to speak no. about the title? I can. Oh, about the title or about the? I would I would like to hear either thing. Was there anything about the? Um, did it, was there anything about the reception of this that surprised you about what people took from it? Well, um, no, that's a tricky question because um, because uh, yeah, there's some things, but then if I reveal them. I become a critic in a kind of a way and tell you uh, the negative thing, which I don't want to tell you. <laughs> and um, but one of the one of the things that I find is uh, I'm really um, I am concerned about how people, uh, how many readers uh, want to have their own experiences reflected in a book. And if their experience is not reflected in the book, the book is of, it, it, it's not interesting to them. So that's not my experience. Therefore, you have, you have done it wrong or something like that. So in terms of um, Sydney's, um, uh, what is it? Um, Sydney's transitioning from male, from female to male, uh, the reasons that Sydney transitioned are atypical, but you know the exception is also very interesting and speaks about a particular um, time and place in lesbian culture and um, in butch culture. And I think um, I think um, butchers are a dying breed, and um, I. I've been taken to task for not writing a more celebratory story of transitioning. And um, because my, uh, my story is not the typical experience of transitioning. So, you know, I say that and I'm sweating because I have been taken to task by people in the trans movement. And I think to myself, but gosh, there's so many stories. There isn't just one reason. And everyone who transitions is, you know, it's not, it's a happy situation for many people, and for some people, it isn't. It doesn't solve the, the problem that they feel, you know, deep inside. And so, I, so that, that's been something. And the thing is that the, the books, the stories that we write, they're not stories that are, in a kind of a way, they're on the paper, but they're questions. They're, they're meant to provoke questions and discussion and, you know, and, um, and to battle with this, the issues in them, not to denounce them. And that's, um, that's something that's very passionate to me, it's to, you know, to write and to show paintings, to show work in a gallery and debate it, not shut it down, not throw it out, you know. Absolutely. Well, I just want to share a story because this happened today uh, with um, related to, pe to readers' responses to your work. Uh, I'm in this really unusual situation where my first book is being used as a book that students in Nigeria applying to university have to read. And so I'm getting a lot of Facebook and uh, emails from pe many people that I don't know. And there was one Facebook, and I can't read all of them, there are too many, but occasionally I'll read some of them. And, there was one yesterday who said, I really hate your book. It's so boring, it's so terrible. How could you write this awful thing? And, and I've responded to a couple of other people who've said, oh, it's just brilliant, you know, I just love it. And so I thought, okay, well, I'll respond and say, you know, I'm really sorry you didn't enjoy this, but I hope you find something that inspires you and find a book, you know, that makes you very happy. And the, the immediate response was, 
oh, I'm so sorry, I'd only read the first few pages, oh, you know, and, and it's much better now, and all I, you know, I don't know what the situation was, but I, but I guess I found myself thinking a lot about social media and how, you know, what is that space where people can just throw things down, you know, either great praise or, you know, great hate. Um, so it's, I think it's an interesting time for writers. Uh, we are much more, we're closer to the readers, whether we want to be or not. I have a friend who's always warning about this who says, um, who says you can't read your feedback because you'll end up tailoring all your stories to that one very angry person in New Jersey. Right? <laughs> um, I, just, I just imagine the time, if, if, if the Facebook Messenger smartphone was available in time of Virginia Woolf or Lev Tolstoy and I could just pop up at their screen to just say, oh, I love your work. Just, I would have loved doing it. I would have loved to interrupt their work and just praise them with my enthusiasm. I also, now I'm wondering what criticism they would have gotten, right, from the angry person in New Jersey. Like, oh, why is Mrs. Dalloway? <laughs> is that? What would they say to Ulysses? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Poor Shakespeare. It's too long, it's too boring. <laughs> oh, God, I love it. I love Ulysses. Um, there's this, when you're writing about relationships, we all, we all know the, the tropes that have been overdone to a bit. So the star-crossed lovers and the, um, the alienated parent and child and the um, person who is so divorced from themselves that they can't get close to any other human. When you're writing, when you're writing and you know that this is the kind of standard trope that's been out there and explored, but you're treading near that territory to make an original story. Are you aware of that at all? Are you aware of, of the kind of the story that's been told a million times before, or, or do you not feel it so much? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very interesting question regards uh, a love story that takes place between an Arab woman and a, and a Jewish, an Arab man and a Jewish woman, sorry. Um, because I had to really struggle with the poetics around the conflict and the poetics around the uh, Romeo and Juliet and all the West Side Story and I, I, I don't see so much, I refuse to see any romance in war and I refuse to see poetics in, in, in a time of, of agony and, and, and still I wanted to have that these two experiences possible emerge this possible integration <laughs> to have the, these two identities reflected in one another, explored one by one another, to have the dual perspective carried by each of one's gaze, to, to, to in, internalize one another uh, narrative, one another justifications, that they would be going back to their tribes, they will be able to contain uh, and to empathize, so that's yeah. just just by the power of identification that goes through a reader, it's so intimate. And this this book is about intimacy. It's because it reflects our intimate life of those two nations. It's trying to, if you wear the the political glasses, you can see that there is a symbiosis that we, as the two the the, the two peoples, we experience, the need for boundaries, this relationship between the two. Um, the, I'm, I'm a great uh, believer in, 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 in borderlines to be able to evolve into respect. And the fact that we don't have uh, 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 geographical barriers between those two identities in a way that, it's, that it would be able to, go to, to, to diffuse to be open and closing in a respectable way. Mm -hmm. uh, it's maybe the, the fact that we carry those uh, those barriers within us and encounters on the ground. Yeah. I think what strikes me about all the writers here is that 
to one extent or another, they're exploring stories that really sort of haven't been told before. Um, not necessarily. Um, I mean, so that's the most striking thing for me, I think, rather than trying to think about how it's different from stories that have been told before. Yeah, you know, I was actually more just about the self-consciousness, if you have that kind of self-consciousness, because you all did, tear out, you also all told these kind of remarkably interesting stories. They could, and they could have gone south, but they never, they didn't, and they were, they were very bracing and beautiful. And I was wondering, I found myself as I was reading, wondering like if there was ever that self-conscious part of you that, um, that was worried about that. But it sounds like no, maybe not. Not until just now. Okay, don't be. <laughs> don't be. Um, actually, I wanted to give the audience a chance to ask questions because we have just a bit of time left if there were questions. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question for me. Um, I'm just curious um, if you feel, or I, I, I don't want to ask it as a leading question, I'm just asking if you feel proud. Um, so do you, um, how do you, I think it's fantastic that your book was banned by the Ministry of Education in Israel, but how do you feel about it? I was overwhelmed. I, I, we have never had such a, a thing, and I don't think it's going to be ever repeated, uh, because uh, they had uh, benefited me with such a publicity that now they they are so sorry for for uh, trying to limit uh, the book's uh, path and and created the other side effect an effect of having extended. Uh, it's a uh, crowd, but I was overwhelmed because I am a fruit of the Israeli democracy. I'm a product of the Israeli democracy. So being brought up on this liberal way of life, freedom of speech, I am, uh, I am a daughter of immigrants from Iranian descent, as I said. I'm Jewish, uh, first generation Iranian family in Israel. So I'm the very first newborn to enjoy the liberty that so many, especially women in my family, were prevented from. So me being to, to threat my freedom of speech, they have messed with the wrong person. <laughs> my redemption is my freedom of speech, of behavior, of thoughts, of art. So I had many, 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 many Israelis who were supporting me and, and marching behind my book as a symbol to the threat of, of, of the freedom of speech in Israel. And um, it, it's, it's proven to be a bad step. I, I, I am, uh, thank you for the question, and I hope it's <laughs> what you expected. <laughs> hmm. I also have a question for you. Um, when you were writing the characters, did you ever think if you had switched their nationalities, if you were writing about an Arab woman, or a Muslim woman, and an Israeli man, um, if the story altogether would have changed? It's an interesting question. Do you want the more logical answer, or the more fiction, or the more emotional? Um, well. <laughs> I, I, Whatever. To, to, be, to be honest, uh, when, even when you create fiction that is based on me a memory, but it's mixed with a distant portion of imagination, you still have to, to have a balance of uh, conviction, self-conviction to go on with the story. And to have a, a Palestinian woman and an Israeli man, it's so, so rare due to the histories, the traditions, the conditions of the biographies to have it be, to have a chance for such a thing to happen. Not because it is impossible, but there are so many restrictions within the Arab femininity that is, is in a way hard to believe and you have to believe in your story. And on the other way around, the, the manhood coming from Israel is um, equipped with an experience that contradicts its belief. It's, uh, it, it's not valid in such a way that you can maintain the writing, to my experience. And I go to my experience because I was basing the character of Hilmi, 
the Palestinian or a, true, or a true person I met here in New York, an artist that was living here uh, for, five, for, for four years, and I uh, came to know him closely, and it was a very, very meaningful encounter that I experienced spending the harsh winter of New York together with a Palestinian. To not only to be to be around uh, Middle Easterns that our childhoods as Israeli kids we were failed to acknowledge them. Uh, New York had opened a curtain to to come to know those uh, Egyptians, those Jordanians, those Palestinians, Lebanese people who were uh, kept away from our sights by government, by politics, by the circumstances of our Israelis in the Middle East. It was such a revelation, such a, such a great experience to see how close we are, how resemble we are, we are, how much the temper is alike, how much the body language is alike, how much there is about the humor and the interest. Um, so it was a, a big thing for me. And I, I, could, I could, for the very first time, acknowledge the, 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 the concept of being, owning a homeland, of how much I appreciate and cherish uh, my Israeliness. It was very funny. It was via this closeness with the Palestinian men. So it's, uh, the book is giving him life, because he had lost his life. Uh, and I uh, tried to carry his memory and commemorate his memory and to and to have many many people fall in love with him like I experienced and apparently the Ministry of Education found it to be dangerous <laughs> that Israeli young readers would fall in love with a Palestinian uh, character that's what the, the, the main reason for the ban God, we need to get our books banned, man. <laughs> Don't you think? We can do it tonight. I would just say that there's a huge, huge gap between the literary work that its merits are not being provocative and not being uh, teasing. It's been being honest and authentic like a good literature should be and I don't think the ban reflects my work it reflects the changes that Israel is going through so I cannot be credited for the that's ban. very that's very modest but it's, it's not, not it's it does not, not reflect what you read uh, sorry? Sorry? it does not reflect what you read you're being modest that was gorgeous thank you so much I loved yeah I was on the verge of, of crying when you were reading I, I love it when, when, when uh, we can hear the voice of the, of the writer because we can experience the, 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 the vulnerability of being a, 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 a person sitting in a closed room for years and, and believing in this torment of writing a novel. It's always such a struggle that when you, you come up reading, you can actually sense something of this solitude, this concentration, this honesty. So I, uh, I, I feel we share it all tonight. Hi, um, it was just a wonderful evening. I thoroughly enjoyed um, all of you talking about your books. I have two questions. Um, the first one for Sarah. Um, so, I'm interested in um, your character is bicultural, and then you as a writer, you're multicultural as well. And you talk about um, two aspects that I, I think have a bit of an inversion in the two cultures that you're referring to, i.e., age and um, overt sexuality, where, um, from what I understand about the culture Mariah is in, um, age accords a certain visibility in the Nigerian context. Uh, overt sexuality, um, conversely, is not. It's, it's very conservative. Um, so it's 
Francisco is probably kind of like the other way around. So I was just wondering, in sort of coming up with that um, tension in the two cultures, what was um, first Moriah's perspective and what was your perspective as a, as a writer of that character? Um, and then my second question was, why, why a cat? <laughs> <laughs> Is that an anthropomorphic context, to the choice of a cat as opposed to a pigeon? <laughs> you should go for the, the problem with you is I just I want to listen to your own interpretation. Like I forget what I have to say. I, I've even forgotten what the question was that you were asking. Um, yeah, what was the question you were asking? Uh, sexuality, yeah. age. Yeah. You know, one culture celebrates age. Um, perhaps I'm just trying to suppress this sexuality because of the preservative to it. Perhaps an inversion, perhaps not. I'm just wondering, like, from your perspective, knowing the two cultures, what's, how did you think about that uh, tension? Was it something that you personally were self-conscious about? Uh, or was it something that you basically had to... Yeah, I think... Um, I, I was thinking about issues of aging in San Francisco because, as I said before, San Francisco, like New York or many, any city, in, major city in America, the emphasis is, is on youth. And um, I think, you know, I, I was surrounded and still am surrounded by friends who are much older, friends who come from different cultures, and I'm fascinated by the way that age and sensuality uh, live differently. I, I think I, I'm not completely agree, you know, if I think of Nigeria and sort of women's expressions and so forth, you know, I wouldn't quite agree that age is revered and sort of a woman's <coughs> sexuality is not, if that's what you're saying. So I think I would quibble a little bit with that. Um, so, but, but in terms of my writing the book, I think it just really stemmed from seeing all these vibrant, interesting women who were putting themselves out there in later decades. Um, and, uh, you know, I recently, I don't know if you read this, but I recently wrote, I think you did, a story about the woman that I met after I finished writing the book, who I met her in a nail parlor and we were talking and I thought she was the same age as my character, 75, and it turned out that she's two decades older. She's she was 96, going on 97, and uh, she, <laughs> I started to talk to her and I said to her, um, will you please let me write your life story, because her life is just fascinating. And her response was, uh, she's African American from Tennessee, and she, so she said, honey, I have too many secrets to start with. You know, my man friend doesn't know how old I am. He's talking about his mama died when, you know, she was 96 and, you know, I'm a year older, you know, so, I mean, for me, that was, that was just, here I was, actually, when I wrote Mariah, I wanted her to be around 80, and then I kept getting all the pushback, not just, you know, from globally, not necessarily just Nigerians, but everyone saying, you know, come on, you know, you can't, you can't have such a flamboyant, sensual woman who's 80, so I took her down to 75. But then I met Willard, and I'm like, hell, you guys, you know, the, the, you know she, she has a man who picks her up in a Bentley, and, you know, you know. So anyway, so I just, you know, okay, that's not necessarily the story for everybody, but I just, as a writer, it's just always questioning and probing and um, challenging the things that we take for granted. And did you want to answer that, Kat? Uh, do we have time? Do we have just a bit? Yes. Yes, so yeah, and uh, I was, when I was writing this novel, I was really inspired by this, this, this theory called animal studies which tries to locate how animals are, are, are anthropomorphized and always read as symbols, as, as, as symbols of human or our characteristics, especially in literary works. So, uh, so uh, basically I wanted to, to incorporate these animals in my novels because there are all kinds of cats and all kinds of snakes and some of them talk, some of them slither, some of them, and they are, and I just wanted to, 
to underline that that by that that we are all distinctive and unique and and that to explore that possibility that there is something something uh, we need to t take in consideration when we write animals in in literature and sometimes even have books that have animal narrators in them even though we don't have access to to an animal's consciousness but we still do that so animals in a way can be seen as others in this way in the same way as like ethnic minorities or or sexual minorities that I also write about in this book but they can't defend themselves in the same way so so the process of like depicting animals and placing them in 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 art is is somewhat yeah, yeah. Oh, we have one, we have one more question here in the back. Hi, this question is for Sarah. So, reading your novel gave me a sense of pleasure that I realized I hadn't had in a while, which mostly speaks to, you know, maybe the kind of reader that I, I am. And I've heard writers say things like, when I, you know, the process of writing this book was so draining, maybe because of the subject matter, that I had to recover after writing it. But since yours, you know, gave someone like me a sense of pleasure, I wondered what the process of writing that kind of book was like for you, if you had a similar experience. So you've just been listening to No Violet Bulawayo who wrote a fantastic book, We Need New Names. It did give me a lot of pleasure to write this book, um, in part because I was just frustrated with society that's just, um, can see nothing good about growing old. And, um, you know, we all hope to grow old, it's sort of ironic, we hope to grow old and not drop dead in our youth, and yet we don't want to grow old. And um, I think every time I wanted to stop writing the story or I wondered where the story was going, I would meet some other incredible woman whose story would just lift me up and, you know, make me excited about whatever time I have left on this earth and just showed me a way to, to live. And, I, and I'm, you know, I'm also not saying that all the old people I know are just fabulous and drive Porsches and so <laughs> forth. Um, you know, people get sick, people lose their memory, people, you know, things like this are very difficult. And I think that's, I guess that's the other, the other confession that I should make about the book, which is one of my older friends, um, as I was writing this, had Parkinson's with Parkinson's related dementia. And so I guess there's a part of me that, and I found that her progress and her life at the very end was very, very difficult and hard. Um, and so in a way, I suppose this book is a bit of a love letter to her. Um, it's a life that I would have liked to have seen her have towards the end of her, her years. Thank you to all of our wonderful authors. Thank you. I the books are also for sale outside, so be sure to go, and our authors will be here for just a minute. Thank you all for coming.